Hello everyone and welcome to Network Playroom. In this video, we're going to discuss OSPF virtual links. So it is a rule in OSPF that all areas must connect to the backbone area or area zero. Now I discussed this in my previous video in more detail and I can leave a link to it if you want to go back to that to find out uh, why this is and why each area must connect to the backbone area. Anyways, however, in, in some cases where it is not possible to have a physical connection, you can use a virtual link to connect to the backbone through a non-backbone area. And you can also use virtual links to connect two parts of a partitioned backbone through a non-backbone area. So I have a diagram on the screen here from Cisco documentation and the black line here depicts the virtual link which goes through area one right here and which is also referred to as the transit area. Now remember that because uh, we're going to need that later. So there are some rules associated with the configuration of virtual links. Number one, virtual links must be configured between two ABRs. And to recap, ABR is a router that is connected to two or more areas and one of them is the backbone area. So if you look at the diagram, uh, R3, well, I'm gonna call it R3 for simplicity and I'm going to call this R1. So R3 is not an ABR because it does not satisfy this condition. Yes, it is connected to two areas. So area two and, and area one. But not the backbone area. So the virtual link is configured between R1 and R3. So right here and here. So number two, the area through which the virtual link is configured known as the transit area, here it is again, must have full routing information. And number three, the transit area cannot be a stub area. And we haven't discussed OSPF area types yet, such as the stub area, but briefly, by configuring a stub area, you suppress external route advertisements through the ABR. So instead, the ABR advertises a default route through itself in place of the external routes. So the stub area has limited routing information. And this is obviously against point number two, which stated that the area must have full routing information. Now, interestingly, note that once the routers become adjacent on the virtual link, R3 considers itself an area border router because it now has a link to area zero. So once this happens, now, R3 actually has a connection to area zero or the backbone. So now it actually does become an ABR. So next, um, it is also possible to use a GRE tunnel instead of a virtual link. Like you can build a GRE tunnel between R1 and R3 and put the tunnel in area zero. This would provide the same function as a virtual link. I won't go into it more now, but I'll leave a link in the description so you can read more about the subject in Cisco documentation if you're interested. Now, obviously virtual links add a layer of complexity and troubleshooting difficulty to any network. So it is best to avoid the need for them by ensuring that areas particularly the backbone area are designed with redundant links to prevent partitioning. So when two or more networks are merged, 
sufficient planning should take place beforehand so that no area is left without a direct link to the backbone. And if a virtual link is configured, it should be used only as a temporary fix to an un unavoidable topology problem. A virtual link is a sign that a part of the network needs to be redesigned. And a permanent virtual link is virtually always a sign of a poorly designed network. So those are just some design considerations to keep in mind. Uh, so virtual links should only be configured when necessary and not as a per permanent solution. But now let's quickly look at how to configure a virtual link. And as mentioned, the virtual link is configured between ABRs. The configuration itself is simple, but there are two important points to consider. Number one, the area is the transit area. This is why I mentioned it in, in the beginning. It has a key role in the configuration. So in this case, it's area one. And number two, the address is the router ID and not the IP address of the interface. So for R1, the configuration would be something like router OSPF one, and then here is the command to configure the virtual link. So area one, again, this is the transit area, virtual link, and then the router ID, 3.3.3.3. And this was for R1. And now for R3, not B3, R3, it would be router OSPF, that looks like a weird R, almost looked like a V, router OSPF, one, again, area, one because of the transit area, virtual link, and then the router ID of R1, which is 1.1.1.1. One dot one dot one dot one. So that's really it. That's uh, how simple the configuration is. But again, you need to remember those two things that you must use the transit area and the router ID in the command. But uh, we'll look at this again once I get to lab videos. I don't have a lab set up at the moment, so unfortunately I can't show you this on the command line, but hopefully I'll get one up and running soon. But yeah, that's it for this video. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.